Why does sex sometimes complicate life? Why in our day and age, if God has given us this wonderful gift of sex, is there so many difficulties attached to it? And God puts boundaries around it. Why? Well, we're looking at the Ten Commandments and we're looking at that commandment in Exodus chapter 20 and reading from verse 14, where we read God's word, which says, you shall not commit adultery. Well, for these two weeks now, last week and this week, we've been looking at this seventh commandment together. And we are reminded in this commandment that there are many facets to the issue of sex. And of course, we live in a sex-saturated world. And of course, sex is an awkward subject at its very best. And especially as we sit in the presence of God, we don't often th uh, link talking with God and sex together. But the reality is God has something to say about the subject because God made you and he made you in his image. And he has made sex to be good. He has made sex to be great, in fact, within a heterosexual marriage where he created it to function, which, of course, raises the questions that we need to perhaps address, like what about homosexual sex? And now that can be a really awkward subject as well. And yet people are asking these questions. Many Folk are wrestling with this in their own hearts. Folk are questioning their own sexuality, questioning their thought life. And there is a sense in, in our modern world, there is much confusion on this matter. I remember one homosexual person uh, saying to me, but hey, I'm a good person. I obey the Ten Commandments. Uh, I'm a faithful to my mate. Uh, and why uh, is there any issue here? You see, it's not adultery, this person said, because I'm faithful to my mate. The problem, of course, was a question of his understanding, and which was a very underst a narrow understanding of that word adultery. Now, this question of adultery being sex with somebody, a, a married person uh, outside of your marriage, is nothing new. That understanding of being uh, very narrowly defined in that way is the way the Pharisees in Jesus' day defined adultery. They said, of course, that adultery is simply sex with a married woman who is not your own wife. And so they then went on to say, well, if that's the case, we can have sex with any unmarried woman where prostitution came in and temple prostitutes came into the picture. But it was Jesus that came and confronted that fallacy among the uh, Pharisees of his day. And he said, hey, you need to remember adultery is not just with a married woman. If you look at another person with lust in your eyes, you have as good as committed adultery, said Jesus. And that's a sobering thought. Because Jesus was teaching us that any sex outside of marriage hurts everybody involved in the process. And that's why we need to start with sex outside of marriage and see why any sex outside of marriage hurts everyone. So firstly then, let's look at sex outside of marriage. And of course, sex outside of marriage is now the norm. In our society, it's no longer abnormal. Many young couples are living together before they get married. And it's been a case of since the 1960s, this situation has got progressively worse. And even before that, of course, there was immor immorality. There was sex before marriage. But since the 1960s, there has been a deliberate attack on this accepted standard that a person would leave their parents, marry, and then engage in sex. But today, the whole question of immorality, of sex before marriage or outside of marriage, is propagated in many books, many films and television programs. Many plays have made it uh, very popular. 
There was, of course, that very racy play of a few years back called Oh, Calcutta. And it was caused a stir around the world as it promoted immorality. Uh, strangely enough, it was the Australians who came up with a, another play that was called No, No, Calcutta, in which a doctor uh, was taken, uh, was questioned in court, and he questioned a psychologist about this issue of immorality growing in society. And the illustration was used in that play and in the court case that was depicted in the play of the old story about frogs. That if you put a frog into a pot of boiling water, that frog will immediately jump out. It knows the water is hot and it will jump out and be free and saved. But if you put another frog in a pot of cold water and you put that pot on the stove and switch the stove on and as that pot heats up, this frog will swim around and around the pot and slowly swim slower and slower till it stops swimming and die. And the point that was made was that as culture has uh, progressively promoted immorality and sex outside of marriage, so more and more of us are not jumping out of it and saying, hey, this is wrong. We're going along with the immorality and being sucked into that vortex more and more. And so we no longer recognize the danger and we die spiritually in the process. Now, you and I live in a world that is sexually desensitized. It is morally uh, bankrupt in a large sense. And so we need to again come back to what did God create us to be? And we need to ask the question, why is premarital sex or sex outside of marriage wrong? Well, there are a few reasons. One, why can't we, for instance, have sex outside of marriage? We love one another or we're going to get married one day anyway. Well, premarital sex is sex by anticipation. It denies the biblical and mature concepts of self-control that we read about in Galatians 5. And we read about in 1 Corinthians 12, the idea of love being patient. And so if we are having sex before marriage, we are not being patient and we are not being spirit-filled and self-controlled. And we are in actual fact not experiencing true love. We are simply falling into the temptation of lust. That's why we need to remember that premarital sex then is not a true love. It is not a biblical love. Remember last week we looked at true biblical love as agape love, a self-sacrificing love, a love that seeks the highest good of the recipient of that love. And sex before marriage is taking what is not ours before it is offered. And we need to remember that it falls short of God's standards. And when anything falls short of God's standard, it is sin. God calls us to the highest standard, 100% following his 10 commandments. And when we fall short, we sin. That difference is sin. And now that means that it is not God's kind of love. So premarital sex is wrong, firstly, because it is sex in anticipation. But it is also wrong, secondly, because someone else might say, yes, well, let young people experiment, or you've got to see if you're compatible with one another sexually. And again, we need to say to that, thinking, no. Premarital sex by experiment has no permanence. It's not a solid foundation on which to build our lives. In actual fact, we find it ultimately destroys our lives. It's a little bit like the rich man who says, I want to experience what it's like to be poor. I'll go and live in the slums for a while. And to feel that it uh, is going to be beneficial to know what it is like to be poor by living in the slums is a false understanding of poverty. Why? 
Because unlike the slum dwellers, the rich man can always walk out of the slums any day he likes. And the same happens with sex. If we touch it before God created it to be enjoyed, it, is, it loses its beauty. Marriage can never be an experiment. Marriage is always a commitment till death do us part. It's a lifelong commitment. It's the one relationship here on earth that God has called us to that doesn't break up or ghost us or disappear on us. So premarital sex is wrong because of anticipation. It's wrong because of experimentation. But you might say, thirdly, well, why can't we just live together? I can't be bothered with all that fancy ceremony, white gowns and all the paperwork. Well, it's just a piece of paper, somebody has said to me when they talk about marriage. But this case of premarital sex is still wrong because living together fails to mark an obligation where we obligate ourselves and commit ourselves to another person. At the very least, marriage is meant to be a contract, but far more than a contract. In God's eyes, marriage is a sacred covenant. And so just as no business deal on earth would be contracted by simply uh, a, a nod or a wink or a, a, a quick jump into bed or a drunken uh, bit of passion, so we expect a signature at the bottom of the page and lawyers to draw up all the contracts. Well, at the very least, we need to be wise and do what protects that marriage in the long term. Living together is then naive. Living together is short-sighted because it creates problems down the road. And then you might say, well, what about the career woman who wants a baby but doesn't want a husband or wants a test tube baby? For her, premarital sex is simply selfish because the child will lose that second parent, the second parent's financial support, the child will lose the uh, support of a father and all the impact that that father can make. God designed us to be parented by two parents and nothing can replace that. This girl is simply thinking too much of herself and too little of the child that will come from that. And so sex outside of marriage is a far greater temptation in our day and age. And today we are discovering that we have removed so much of the fear linked with premarital sex. The fear of contraception, for instance, is limited by people taking the pill, by condoms and by all the offers of abortion that are made both uh, illegally and legally. But there's also the, the fear of detection is no longer there because the whole societal attitude is that premarital sex is okay. Everybody's doing it. The TV shows say it's normal and there is little shame left anymore. It is really only the incurable diseases that are evading the cure of infection that have sobered people up. Like HIV AIDS have reminded us that we cannot always get away with what we think we can. You see, sex outside of marriage is a sobering reality. That if we all remain faithful and we only married our spouse and two virgins married, a virgin man and a virgin woman, then HIV would be wiped out in a few years because it wouldn't be passed from one person to another. It would be stopped. And that vivid picture that any sex outside of marriage hurts everyone is seen in the tragedy of folk dying from HIV or needing to spend huge amounts of money on antiretrovirals and all the problems that go with that are a reminder that this was not how God intended us to live. That's why any sex outside of marriage hurts everyone. It even threatens the very welfare of the individual, not only as individual people, but all of society. This we have seen historically as J.D. Unwin 
reminded us as a historian when he studied 88 civilizations here in Africa, Egypt, and the Niger civilizations, and Rome, and Greek, Greece, Greek civilizations, etc. 88 of these civilizations, and he came to the conclusion, he says this, every civilization is established and consolidated by observing a strict moral code. It is maintained while this code is kept and decays when sexual license is allowed. We can think of the classic example as the Roman code. Roman Dutch law is what South African law was originally founded on. But now we see the Roman Empire collapsed by sexual immorality. It collapsed from within. And we need to be reminded that God is a God who says that any sex outside of marriage hurts everyone not just yourself. But if sex outside of marriage is something that God condemns, then we need to see, secondly, we need to look at the question of sex with the same sex as in gender. That then follows on from sex outside of marriage. Now, a few years ago, uh, most statistics put homosexual men at around about 5% of the population and homosexual women that are another 5% of the population. But more recent statistics, both in the United States and South Africa, put that figure far lower, around right about 2.5% for each gender, and then uh, combined at around about 5 sometimes 6% of the population. But the reality is that tiny 5 or 6% of the population is very vocal. And they have plenty of money, many of the times because they have no children to support or families to develop. And often they're of the higher intellectual and economic strata of society. And so the voice from the gender activists is very loud. But the Bible is clear that homosexuality is something that has been known. It has been known throughout the ages and is usually linked with idol worship. And homosexuality is clearly condemned in the Old Testament, in passages like Leviticus 18 and verse 22, and in the New Testament, in passages like Romans 1, verse 26 and 27, even as we read at the beginning of this playlist. And throughout history, and even today, homosexual acts have been the problem. For the Christian, the Bible is clear in forbidding homosexual acts. But the discussion of homosexuality as a state or as something that people say they, they've grown up in is a different question altogether. Because of the aura of the unnaturalness of the subject, it makes the discussion difficult. But also the different kinds of homosexuality require different responses. For instance, those effeminate males and masculine females who are struggling with their sexuality and their sexual identity, need great compassion and love. While those who are homosexual by choice, or just for the, the fun of it, or the kicks, as the saying goes, they need to be challenged on the immorality of it, and the need for the rebuke for using people in these sort of sexually difficult ways. Now that homosexuality has been legalized in our country and around the world, discrimination of homosexuality is wrong. But the question then arises, what do we do? What do we say to this issue? Well, firstly, we need to accept that the Bible is our supreme rule of faith and practice. What your opinion or my opinion are is immaterial. God gives us his word as an absolute in this age. But secondly, we need to say that the practice of homosexuality is wrong, not the person that has fallen into that temptation. Thirdly, prison is not the solution and the answer for the crimes of homosexuality like happened in our country before our present dispensation. For prison is a little bit like locking up an alcoholic in a distillery for the night. It does not solve the problems. In actual fact, you may have read in the newspapers this past week or in the, heard on the news 
about that prison, that women's prison in the United States that has a whole number of pregnancies because two transgender uh, women stroke men are in that prison. And guess who's impregnated the other female inmates in that prison. And while that may be a sad humor to it, the reality is that we also need to recognize that any sex outside of marriage hurts everyone. And we might laugh at it. We might be tempted to fall into the temptation of seeing the humor. But the reality is human beings are hurt by it. And we need to then find a biblical solution by accepting that homosexuality is not normal. It is not what we are called to as God's people. And we need to offer controlling and biblical solutions to this. We need to offer spiritual counsel and know that there is a solution to those temptations and that pain and that uh, draw card in people's lives. I need to maybe tell you a story about a man by the name of Andres. When I was a pastor in Pretoria, he was a member of the church and I visited Andres. He was an upstanding citizen in the sense that he was a school teacher, head of department. He had been a deacon in his church and he was married and he also was practicing homosexual acts. And what he did was when he'd had supper with his wife, he made her a cup of tea or coffee or whatever it was and put a sleeping pill in her evening cup of coffee. And she then fell asleep and he went off and engaged in homosexual practices. Well, in one incident, he was uh, confronted by his sin and cried out to God to be saved and to be changed. And God, in his mercy, worked a miracle in his life. And Andres made it his goal to help other homosexual people to find the freedom that they can have in Jesus Christ. And so what Andres did was put a little advertisement in the newspaper in what was called the classifieds in those days. The advertisement simply said that if you're battling with homosexual urges and a homosexual uh, temptation and you'd like someone to counsel you and pray with you, I'll gladly do that. And he gave his telephone number. Well, Andres shared that on an average week, he received between five and six phone calls every week from men in particular that he counseled, and he was able to lead many of them to the wonderful freedom that Jesus gives as he forgives our sins and transforms our lives. And the wonderful thing was that Andres was greatly used of God for many years. And then our country changed the laws. And remember, homosexuality was decriminalized and legalized. And Andres made the observation that the number of people now phoning for help went from five or six a week down to less than one a week. Because no longer did people see it as something that they needed help with. They no longer turned to Jesus. And they no longer remembered that any sex outside of marriage hurts everyone. And just as in the case of sex outside of marriage, premarital sex, same with homosexual sex. God simply says that all of that is sin. It falls short of his standards. And so we need to start with agreeing with God. That's what the word confession means. It means to confess and agree, God, you're right. This practice of mine is destroying me, hurting relationships, breaking me up emotionally, mentally, physically. It's destroying even our country. And so we agree with God that it's wrong. And then we turn to God from that sin. And we, in the case of sexual sin, we cry out to God not only to forgive us and cleanse us, but to supernaturally empower us to change in these days. Now, many times God can do that just by us getting on our knees and earnestly seeking him and praying. But sometimes this battle is so great that we need to call in the help of other Christians, mature believers who can pray with us, speaking to our pastors or other mature believers to 
join with us in prayer because Jesus Christ can save anyone. And Jesus can set us all free from our sin. And Jesus can give us new life. And so he can make you a new creation. And so as a gift from God, he can give you new life if you will turn to him because of what he did for you and me on that Roman cross 2,000 years ago. And he did it for us to set us free from any sex outside of marriage that will hurt us and will lead us down a downward spiral into worse and worse things because of what he has done for us. And he can forgive us of homosexual sin, of any other sexual sin, as he calls us to the joy of beautiful sex within marriage that he created. So I want to ask you, do you need to turn to Jesus Christ today? Do you need to cry out to him, Jesus, save me, before that downward spiral sucks you literally into the drain of eternity? Turn to him today and join with me even now in prayer. Shall we pray? Oh Lord Jesus, please meet with us, we ask. Touch us and help us this day. As we've talked about these sensitive issues, help us to not only cry out to you to save us from our sexual sin, but to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Even sins like pornography and masturbation and other premarital and extramarital sins of sexual of a sexual nature free us we pray to live for you in this day and age wholeheartedly oh lord jesus pour out your love into our lives and give us a supernatural power to experience the joys of sexuality within the bounds of heterosexual marriage where you created it to be a beautiful thing and so Watch over us, Lord. Lead us by your Holy Spirit to grow in this area of our lives. And lead us to be a blessing in our world and not part of the relational breakdown that we see all around us. Oh, Lord, we pray for a supernatural transformation. We cry out to you, Jesus, save me. And save me even in this area of my sexuality. For this I ask in the all-powerful name of Jesus Christ who is fully human and understands me and is fully God and alone can transform me supernaturally. And so I pray then in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Well, may God empower you and strengthen you. And if I can pray for you or help you in some way, please get in contact with me. You can email me at pastordrbc80 at gmail.com. And may God strengthen you. If there is some way that we can pray with you, we would gladly do that. But may God lead you to wholeness and then to live your life to the glory of our one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so to him be all the praise and the honor, both now and forevermore. Amen.